Thank you, Jane, very much. Um, we're thrilled, we're honored, in fact, that uh, the Wilson Center has agreed to, to partner with us in uh, hosting the release of the Council's 2012 study. Um, this is a great institution now, very, very capably led by Jane, and we're, we're delighted to have this opportunity to collaborate with you early in your tenure. Uh, so I have a really tough job, and that is to try to present the findings of uh, a rather exhaustive study of American thinking about uh, U.S. foreign policy. I'm looking forward very much to the panel and to their comments, so it's incumbent upon me to try to get this done as rapidly as possible, and I'll have to ask for your forgiveness in advance, because um, I'm going to breeze through a lot of data, and frankly, it's the tip of the iceberg of what the Council has done. As uh, Jim Zogby would know from his own work, one doesn't get to report um, uh, nearly as much of, wh of what one finds as one would like. Methodology, I'm not sure where I'm pointing this. There we go. Uh, the methodology is pretty straightforward. It's a a uh, random sample of all America, of all adult Americans, and our survey research is done based on an internet sample drawn random through random uh, selection process of uh, random digital dialing uh, by GFK Customer Search, uh, formerly known as Knowledge Networks. Uh, we actually interviewed 1,877 individuals. That's about twice the normal national sample, and we do that because we ask so many questions that we need to have a larger sample in order to keep the margin of error uh, quite low, which, you, as you can see, is less than, less than 3%. So let me first offer an, an overview of the key findings of the study, and that'll make me feel less guilty about racing through so many graphs. Um, Ten years after 9-11, after um, we see that Americans are, are recalibrating. They're in the process, and underscore this is process, this is a snapshot in time, of recalibrating their views on international engagement and searching for what in their view would be at least equally effective but less costly ways to project positive U.S. influence and to protect American interests around the world. Um, despite the struggles, uh, both in foreign policy and economically at home, Ameri of the last 10 years, Americans still feel the United States has a positive play to, uh, place in the world, a positive role to play. Um, they're uncertain about the implications of the Arab Spring, but they see the Middle East as the greatest source of, of future threats to the United States by far and are apprehensive at the same time about how U.S. involvement there, there can be effective um, and less costly. They clearly see Asia as the region of rising opportunity for the United States, although they're mindful of the potential threats for the longer term that might come from Asia, focusing especially on China and its extraordinary economic growth. My presentation will go from here basically four parts. And first, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on how Americans perceive the threats facing the United States and would frame the goals for U.S. foreign policy. Secondly, what kind of a role, broadly speaking, do they want the United States to play in the world? Thirdly, what are their policy preferences for achieving those goals? And finally, a little more in particular about how they view the Middle East and Asia. So first, um, we find that Americans, and this is our description, of course, moving past, slowly past, uh, gradually past a, a decade of war and uh, thinking about its implications for them. They recognize the world as a very different place in many respects than it was in 2002. Um, the consensus around the nature of threats and across partisan and generational lines that really defined U.S. thinking and responses to 9-11 to is, is in the process of breaking down. We will see significant differences between partisan groups and generational groups. And millennials, those between 18, ages of 18 and 29, and independents uh, in our political analysis particularly demonstrate a shifting orientation on the part of Americans. 
They emphatically do not view the wars of, in Iraq and Afghanistan as having been successful, um, not worth the cost, um, and they do not see them as having brought results commensurate with the cost. And finally, of course, economics is uppermost in their mind. So here is the, the evolution of the perception of threat, terrorism as a threat over the last 10 years, and you can see there has been a slow downhill trend with a kind of plateau in the middle, but a, a clear downturn over the last two years in the way they see the threat, obviously, in, in the absence of, of further major attacks on, on the homeland. Um, so we had a very considerable drop from 91%, seeing it as a critical threat in 2002 to 67% today. And similar declines have occurred in perceptions of the threats of Islamic fundamentalism and nuclear proliferation. I've mentioned the generational or the age cohort differences. Um, and as you would expect, young people in general uh, see the world in a less threatening fashion than the more uh, the more cynical of us um, in, in, in older age groups. Um, but there is a particular widening of the gap between millennials and, and older age groups that we found in the data. And it's, it's as you will see in other instances as we move through the data, uh, this is not an unusual pattern. There's also clearly a partisan difference. It's not a difference of majorities. Uh, by and large, it's a difference of sort of degree of emphasis or intensity in the way Republicans, Democrats, and, Dem and independents see things. Um, but what, again, particularly I want to point, point you to in this slide is the where independents are. That's the yellow line on the bottom. Independents are beginning to separate themselves from both Republicans and Democrats uh, on a wide variety of issues, and this is but, but one example. On the wars, uh, war in Afghanistan, um, the divide, the crossing of the lines happened now back in 2009, 2010, but it's, it's at the widest point now, the gap between uh, the, uh, the war having been seen worth fighting and not worth fighting. And a very similar pattern on Iraq, although obviously the lines crossed a lot, a lot earlier back in 2004. Um, and we asked a series of questions about how Americans assess the results of both wars. And, and what we've seen is that they really do not believe that, and this is the partisan divide, they do not believe that, that um, terror, the wars have made us safer. They do not believe the wars have advanced the cause of democracy. They do believe both wars have worsened our position uh, in the Muslim world. Uh, on, there is a partisan difference uh, on assessment of the wars, but not striking. As I said, the, the majorities are, particularly in Afghanistan, are on the same side. Uh, that is seeing the war not worth fighting. Uh, Republican opinion is more divided on Iraq. So we've asked Americans about a set of 11 goals, and uh, this is how they respond to those. As usual in the Chicago Council surveys, uh, protect, protecting jobs is is job one of American foreign policy in the minds of Americans. This has always been the case. It is even more emphatically the case. If you interpret the second goal, that of reducing our dependence on foreign oil, at least partially as an economic goal, what's striking in this set of findings uh, in 2012 is that these are the only two goals where the percentage of Americans saying that these are very important have gone up. The, the, the uh, estimates of the importance of the other goals have all dropped by small numbers, by single digits. Um, but there is clearly a pattern there of a sense of lessened threat from outside and greater desire to focus on domestic issues. So coming off of this assessment of threats and this construction of goals, how are Americans going to think about the kind of role we should play? First, uh, um, the good news is, and at least in our estimation, that a majority of Americans do want to stay engaged in the world. 
even those who, by the way, say they want to stay out, there is a desire to be engaged internationally. It's not across the board. They support a style of, of activity in the world of the United States that they would probably characterize as leadership rather than dominance. Um, they, see our, they see the United States as less dominant, as less influential. We'll come to that. Uh, and the majorities of, of both across partisan and generational lines largely agree on these goals, though they differ in intensity. So this is the central measure that many polling organizations have been using for decades to, to gauge this sense of, of internationalism versus isolationism in, in the American mood. And uh, what we see in 2012 is that still a majority of Americans support the U.S. playing an active role, but it's the lowest number that it's been at since 1998. Um, and most more interestingly, the percentage who say stay out 38% in 2012 is the highest it's been since we began polling in 19, or this question in 1974, and one of the highest numbers since the 1950s. Other organizations have asked this question. So the gap between active part and stay out is the largest that we've seen in recent, in recent memory. This is the generational divide on active part, and again, you can see this is somewhat surprising given what else we know about the millennials, but um, we're seeing for the first time in, 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 in our uh, recent studies that, that millennials um, do not, a majority of millennials do not want the United States to play an active role in world affairs. It's a very close divide. It's within the margin of error, certainly. But basically, they're divided, whereas their elders are two, two out of three in favor of the U.S. playing an active role uh, in world affairs. Uh, let me go back. This is the partisan divide on active part. Again, majorities all on the side of the U.S. playing an active role, but Republicans emphatically more so, which would, which uh, makes sense in light of what we else we know about a re Republican uh, emphases on threat assessments. We asked uh, Americans to rate the influence of various countries in the world uh, now and 10 years from now, we asked this question back in 2012. And what you see is a very clear trend of Americans thinking that the United States is less influential than it was before. We don't state a, a reference point for the past assessment. Um, and uh, the United States is still the most influential um, country in the world in their assessment, but uh, it's the gap between U.S. influence and Chinese influence in particular is rapidly narrowing and m many Americans think that the gap will s basically close uh, 10 years from now, extrapolating from what they know at the present. However, when we ask Americans whether they think the United States is a unique nation and the greatest country in the world, a very strong majority says absolutely yes. Um, so there's a, a very strong sense of, of uh, specialness that Americans have, and this is again across uh, generational and partisan lines. Um, they're, uh, they're really, it seems like a cognitive dissonance here, um, but we just think Americans are being quite situational about their assessment. It's not a, a discouragement about the character of their nation, it's an assessment in their minds um, maybe partially informed but thoughtfully arriven, uh, arrived at that the United States has uh, got to trim its sails in certain respects. Americans are also comf com comfortable at the same time with uh, the rise of other countries and the other countries acting more independently in world affairs. This is a question we've asked uh, for two years now in, in a row about Turkey and Brazil acting more independently in foreign policy, and, and the majority of Americans are not uncomfortable with that. Uh, a similar pattern emerges in the way they assess um, the U.S. actions in, in Libya. 
Um, this has been um, described as an example of leading from behind. We did not use what has become a very loaded term. We asked Americans whether they thought the United States should have been a leader in this effort or should have played a major role, minor role, or no role at all. And clearly, the great majority thinks that we should have played a, a major or, or minor role, but not led. They were very comfortable with that decision. So how would they like us to project uh, US influence in the world? What do they say is the key policy preferences? Well, first, very important to understand that even though they, are, they feel much more cautious uh, and selective about the use of military force, they still think that maintaining US military superiority worldwide is a top goal for the United States and is the most effective means we have at our disposal um, to achieve our ends in our foreign policy. Um, there is, however, some lessening of that emphasis on the, on the use of military force, and you'll see that represented in a number of things I'm gonna show you now uh, quickly. And they turn instead, of, instead to diplomatic means, to sanctions, um, and to multilateral efforts, to cooperative efforts with other nations to project American power. We asked them, uh, tell us about the effectiveness, whether these methods are very effective, somewhat effective, U.S. military superiority, building alliances with other countries, trade agreements, placing sanctions on other countries that violate international law, strengthening the United Nations. All of them get majorities saying effective, um, but the one that really stands out most is, of course, uh, their assessment of U.S. military superiority being effective. Now, we, we tried to get at this, these uh, um, policy preferences through some specific country examples, and we asked, as you would expect, a lot about Iran. Um, and we asked them a series of questions. Um, some posed various alternatives, some were posed independently about how they should, how the United States should deal with the threat of, Irani of the Iranian nuclear program. And by the way, they clearly see it as a threat. Three out of four Americans see it as a, as a threat. And there is a strong emphasis, as I've suggested, on its sanctions and diplomatic efforts, not an, uh, an un unwillingness anywhere in the American public to see military strikes against Iranian facilities. But uh, in this case, it was provided that the UN had authorized a strike. Um, and that it was, therefore, in effect, a multilateral effort. Similarly, on North Korea, um, Americans, even though they clearly see the North Korean nuclear program as a threat, nuclear weapons as a threat to the United States uh, and to the international community, they prefer diplomacy. Um, they are willing to see Korean ships stopped and searched for nuclear materials or arms. Of course, that would have to involve military force of some kind, presumably. Uh, but when you come particularly, and this is always the dividing line, when you come to the use of ground troops, putting significant numbers of American troops in, in the line of fire, um, that's where American support, public support, really drops. They also, as I've mentioned, want to, to act militarily when, when necessary in multilateral context. And we posed this question and asking them they, they had to choose one of these methods and only 25% said they thought it was good for the United States to act alone militarily. Similarly, in uses of troops on the, on the Korean Peninsula, um, if, if the North Koreans were to attack the South Koreans, uh, you know, Americans are not in favor of the U.S. intervening militarily if, we, if the U.S. does so alone. But if it does so as part of a U.N.-led operation, uh, Americans would support it. We asked about the support for military bases, long-term U.S. military bases. Um, there is still very substantial support for U.S. military bases uh, around the world. It's declining over time, uh, and we're seeing that, that those who say fewer bases has increased certainly since uh, 20, 2002. Um, but they're, they're, they are holding on to the idea that we need bases in order, if we're to maintain our military superiority, which you've seen is a very important goal. Um, we asked about the use of troops uh, in um, uh, attacking terrorists. 
um, as well as airstrikes. Um, uh, and we found, again, the same pattern of declining support. Again, perhaps not surprising. Um, although you can see that the support for airstrikes, and I, I think we probably could include that in that the use of drones, uh, is still very substantial, nearly, nearly uh, three and four. When you look at a, a goal that is they consider very central to American domestic well-being, such as ensuring the oil supply, uh, then there's a lower percentage, but it's pretty steady over time. And finally, on the use of force, uh, we turn to the current example, and that is Syria. Again, we posed a number of options for dealing with the Syrian uh, civil war, and um, uh, same focus on diplomatic efforts and sanctions. Um, a willingness to see a no-fly zone, I think they probably were not aware that the, the, the use of the need to attack uh, air defenses in order to uh, impose a no-fly zone. Uh, but what this again illustrates is that same that same let's try all the diplomatic measures first. Okay, I'm going to turn now to the Middle East. I've already touched on it in a number of ways. We ask a question: Where do you think most of the future th threats to the United States will come in the years ahead? And uh, by far, uh, they see see the Middle East as the source of threats. Um, and in particular, yes, they see the Iranian nuclear program as a very as the leading threat to the United States in the region. Um, but in line with this same preference for avoiding military involvement, uh, the Americans are are very wary of military action in dealing with Iran. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll turn a little bit to the Arab Spring. We asked, um, trying to pose the the question with some you know, some realism. Suppose Israel were to attack Iranian nuclear facilities, Iran were to retaliate, and Iran and Israel, Israel would find themselves uh, at war. Should the United States intervene on Israel's side militarily? And 59% said no. Um, that's the same finding we had uh, in 2010. Um, so it's a right now it's a pretty it's a pretty stable opinion, and given both this, the uh, importance of the threat that they perceive from the Iranian program and the very strong relationship between the United States and Israel, it is it's a, if not a surprising it's cer certainly a sobering finding. On Arab Spring, uh, they're deeply uncertain about, like many experts on the Middle East about where the so-called Arab Spring is going, the, whatever the season is in the Arab world now, so they're, they're, they're waiting to see. But in that environment, um, opposition to economic assistance, in particular to Egypt, has declined rather sharply uh, over the last two years. Um, we don't have it on this graph, but the same pattern, only more so in ter for, uh, with respect to economic assistance to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, su support for uh, economic assistance to Israel and military assistance to Israel remains pretty stable. And finally, let me turn to, to Asia. Um, we're going to see momentarily that, that Americans now really are beginning to be fully focused on Asia as a region, the region of, of rising importance to the United States. They, are, they see the rise of Asia. They're comfortable with the rise of Asia. Um, they see Chinese economic growth as a, both an opportunity and challenge. They're comfortable with the U.S. military role and presence in, the, in Asia, unlike their discomfort, very deep discomfort with U.S. military involvement at this point in the Middle East. And they look to South Korea and Japan as our key allies in the region to help us achieve our goals. Um, so for the first time in uh, the Chicago Council surveys since 1994, since we began asking this question, a, a majority, a very slight majority of Americans see Asia as more important than Europe to the United States. So Pew came out with a very similar finding uh, last year. Um, we asked about the rise of China as a world power. Is it a critical threat to the United States? Um, uh, the majority, the, the, the overall samples, 40% of Americans said it is, so less than a majority, 
But very interestingly, again, millennials, even to a lesser degree, see China's rise as a threat. They largely look to China uh, as a, an opportunity. Um, we asked about the impact of Chinese economic growth, particularly the Chinese economy becomes as large as or larger than that of the United States. Um, and you'll see Americans are divided. Right now, I think that their jury is out. They see positive impacts. They obviously see them in the Walmart and uh, what, what they're able to, to buy at relatively inexpensive prices, but they also uh, feel and see the effects of jobs moving to China. Um, so there is a potential in this finding, of course, for this to flip and for negative assessments to, to, uh, to increase relative to positive assessments. They draw from this the inclusion still the conclusion still that the United States ought to to uh, seek friendly engagement and cooperation with China. They are not about containment. They are not about limiting the rise of China at this point. And we see it not only in the responses to this question, but also in responses to questions we asked about priorities for uh, how we work with South Co South Korea and Japan. They see. Uh, South Korea and Japan as partners of the United States. They see about equal parts of the American public see China as a rival and as a partner, so there again lies the, the potential for a shift. Um, and as I've said, they're very comfortable with the U.S. Uh, six and ten are comfortable with the, they believe the U.S. military presence in, in East Asia is a stabilizing force rather than a destabilizing force. They support bases in South Korea and Japan, although there is a very, very gradual uh, long-term secular decline in this support, and I think uh, the Pentagon planners will need to be mindful of that going forward, given, given the pivot. So all in all, I think we would describe Americans as chastened uh, by the experiences of, of two wars and, and by, of course, the economic setbacks of the last four years. But they're not retreating in, uh, into isolationism. They want to be more selective in their engagement in the world, much as, uh, much as we found in 2010. They seek a foreign policy characterized um, by all the tools of, of foreign policy, but leading with diplomacy and, and, uh, uh, and economic matters. Um, the, US, the Middle East is critical um, to U.S. interests, but the Americans are, um, I would say at this point, confused and cautious uh, about how to deal with the, what they perceive to be the threats over time from the re Middle East. And they are in the process, I believe, of reorienting to Asia. Thank you very much. Look forward to the panel's comments. <laughs> <laughs>